Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome and uh, good evening. Um, my name is Volker Stollertz. I'm a science journalist and the moderator of this uh, session, which is called The End of Freedom of Thought on the Commercial Use of Big Brain Data. Big data and advanced machine learning techniques may, in the not too distant future, enable machines to read and collect our inner thoughts and emotions produced by our brain non-invasively. At least from this panel's perspective, it is high time to understand and discuss what are the ethical, legal, and social challenges if brain data from consumer neurotechnology can be used and data collected on a large scale as some of the social media companies and entrepreneur investors aim to do. We will discuss briefly what the state of the science is right now in listening to the activity of the brain. Then we will talk about what if brain states can be retrieved. Should these data be treated differently from other types of personal data? like emails, DNA, or psychometric data. And certainly what can be done to protect us and our privacy from the collection of brain data through commercially available brain-machine interfaces in the near future. Let me first introduce the members of our panel. First to my left, uh, we have a journalist and filmmaker Christiane Mietke. Her web series, Homo Digitalis, Wie lange sind wir noch Mensch? was an interactive future experiment produced in collaboration with uh, BR, Arte, ORF, and the Fraunhofer Institute for Arbeits- and Organisationswissenschaft. And uh, if you want to see this uh, project, you can look at www.homodigitalis.tv. Um, Next, we have a physician researcher developing brain-machine interfaces to help patients, Dr. Philip Kellmeyer from the University of Freiburg. And he will explain a little bit about the state of the art in science and the ethical issues he sees in front of us. And lastly, to, my, uh, to the left, uh, we have a re-owned expert in inter public international law and the tough issues surrounding the regulation of dual-use research of concern, Professor Zilia Wenneke. And she's also from the University of Freiburg. And the idea of this uh, hour is that we first have a very brief look into this uh, movie, Homo Digitalis, then start with the discussion, and then open it for all of you to ask questions you may have, and so that we get some idea of uh, where, we, where this is going to head. So, let's start with the video. Der Chip fürs Gehirn. Stellt euch vor, schlechte Noten und Schummeln war gestern. In Zukunft kaufst du dir einen Chip für dein Gehirn. Physikunterricht ist also nie wieder ein Problem. So what I'd like to do is build technology to put into our brain that would allow us to upgrade our operating systems. And that includes first to fix what's broken and then to explore what's possible. Brian's Idee. Ein Computerchip im Hippocampus. Der beschleunigt euer Denken. Ihr werdet aufmerksamer, konzentrierter, kreativer. I hope these technologies can be used to improve humans. I think for humans to thrive, we need to upgrade our operating system. We need to actually interface directly with our brain and improve it on, on every dimension possible. Also Schädeldecke auf, Chip rein. Die Idee klingt einfach. Aber erstmal muss erforscht werden, wie unser Denken überhaupt funktioniert. Der erste Aspekt ist eigentlich, dass man mal das Gehirn überhaupt versteht. Und da sind wir schon sehr weit weg. Wir wissen zwar, welche Regionen ungefähr für etwas äh, zuständig sind, aber wie das Denken wirklich funktioniert, wie das Gehirn wirklich funktioniert, das, das sind wir wirklich sehr weit weg. Doch sind es nicht gerade die verrückten Visionen, die Fortschritt möglich machen? Dein Gehirn in der Cloud. Once we can start making a really clear direct brain link uh, so that your mind can be running outside in the cloud, we can literally increase the speed of that by a billion factor. So you can do in one second what used to take 30 years. We can also give you access to all of the human knowledge that's stored on the internet. 
you can be one heck of a smart guy once you get that technology. And we're talking 2045, 2050. Im medizinischen Bereich funktionieren Hirncomputerschnittstellen bereits. Zumindest bei einfachen Bewegungen. An der University Pittsburgh steuern gelähmte Patienten schon heute einen Roboterarm. Mit der Kraft ihrer Gedanken. Ja. Wie sich sowas anfühlt? Am Ars Electronica Future Lab probiere ich das aus. Ich glaube sehr, sehr stark daran, dass wir mit unseren Gedanken alles schaffen können. Mein Gehirn wird gleich mit einem Computer verbunden. Nicht durch einen Chip im Gehirn, sondern mit Elektroden an meinem Kopf. Passt? Wunderschön. Ist ja wie Bondage hier. <lacht> Für dieses Experiment versuchen wir, dass du mit deinen Gedanken Gegenstände steuerst. Bei Helene verwenden wir ein Verfahren, wo wir mittels Elektroden die Gehirnströme abnehmen. Fühlt sich an, als würde man einen sehr engen Winterhut tragen, aber sonst ist alles entspannt und ich fühle mich wohl bis jetzt. Und so soll es funktionieren. Die Elektroden können meine Gehirnströme lesen. Schaue ich auf das LED für Take-Off, stimuliert das eine bestimmte Stelle in meinem Sehzentrum. Das erkennt der Computer. Die Drohne hebt ab. Jedenfalls in der Theorie. Es wird dir erscheinen, als wäre das LED so groß mhm. vor deinem Gesicht. Und es gäbe nichts auf der Welt als dieses LED. -Licht. Okay, ja. Gut. Probieren wir das doch mal. Habt ihr schon einmal versucht, euch nur auf ein LED zu fokussieren? Das ist nicht so einfach. Jeder andere Gedanke von mir verursacht ein Störsignal. Und die Drohne bleibt am Boden. Und es landet einfach. Das ist so krank. <lacht> okay, um, here are a few seats in front. So some people can come up here and uh, sit here. So you don't have to stand. Okay, you have just seen a little introduction in our topic. And my first question goes to you. Can you explain a little bit more in detail what happens to that lady fixating this uh, light? and then being able to steer this kind of drone. Yes. So I think the first idea, like why I thought it would be good to kind of go into this, this extra of this film and this panel is to show you a little bit those, there are different technologies that exist that are already in use to read our brain waves. And the last that we saw is through EEG. So this is like the cap that she had on her head um, that already kind of in, in specifically in science is used to read brain waves. In this particular field we kind of did it with, with lights and her visual center in her brain, which is kind of a very easy method to do that. There are different approaches. I think Philip can explain that more in detail. But what actually happened was that we could read her brain waves. That signal was then transferred to the computer, and the computer gave the signal to the drone that would then take off or land or go right and left. And that's something that is not in the mass market yet. I mean, we have that a little bit with gaming, um, that people start using those devices, consumer devices, for games. But of course, I think nobody here in this room, I would say, well, has anybody ever tried a um, brain computer interface here? Oh, yeah. Mm. Okay, so four people. <laughs> so um, it's already there in, in a certain niche market, but it's not on the mass market. But what we really see is all big technology companies highly investing in this technology. So it's Facebook, it's Google, it's basically all of them. And uh, the DARPA, which is the research center of the US Defense Ministry. So I think in the future we're going to see uh, a lot of um, like the changes here and we're going to see these devices more and more on the market and my personal concern really is what actually happens if if you just look at this scenario if one percent of all Facebook users wear those devices while surfing and even if you don't be not able to read thoughts even if you're just able to read certain states of mind while people look at uh, like their Facebook feed 
that's very intimate information that Facebook would then know about those persons. And that's for me another step into a breach of privacy that we haven't seen so far with the data that's already collected. We will come into that uh, in more detail, but first let's move on to the physician. So actually, a very simple question. What is actually the EEG picking up from the lady looking at that light? So uh, EEG is the most um, popular method now available because it's uh, non-invasive. It can be measured easily uh, from the skull to record uh, the bioelectric um, activity of the brain. So information transfer uh, in the brain to some degree um, happens uh, via electronic uh, signals and oscillations. And EEG is a method that has been around for a long time. So in the 1930s, uh, uh, it was already uh, around and is used in clinical neurology um, um, to uh, diagnose epilepsy, for example, or just get an idea um, uh, about brain states. Um, and BCIs based on EEG technology uh, have actually been around for quite a while now, so it's about 20 years that researchers have started to use that technology, but what has really transformed this area of research um, is the advent um, of new uh, methods for decoding uh, neural activity, specifically using artificial neural networks for deep learning, a transformative um, method that is used in many sectors of research, many areas, um, drives um, innovation uh, uh, in many areas of technology, but has um, equally shown to be very effective, um, better actually than previous algorithms for uh, decoding brain activity, so that researchers around the world um, are now trying to leverage these new kinds um, of decoding algorithms uh, to better understand brain activity. But what can we decode already and what we can't? Mm -hmm. Let's take again the EEG as a simple device. You could do more, but let's yeah. start with this one. What can you see, what you didn't see before as a physician looking, for example, if you have an, an epilepsy or fourth see it's all disarranged, that's quite easy, but I mean, what about brain states? What do you see? Well, um, so there are two general areas that need to be distinguished. One is using this um, a better technology to improve, um, me uh, to improve diagnostic questions we had before. So, for example, to have a deep learning based system for automatic seizure detection in epilepsy um, or automatic EEG um, um, analysis would uh, relieve the burden of, um, uh, of many neurologists that have to look uh, at hours and hours and hours of EEG data. If that could be automated, that would free a lot of energy for physicians to do other things. Um, so that's one area where this um, technology really ha could have and will have a transformative impact. And the other area is that potentially, uh, and this is, we only see glimpses of that um, right now, uh, at some deeper level it might be um, that these new uh, methods for decoding are able to extract more information uh, from these data than we were able uh, before. Give an example. Um, for example, um, to be able to detect in real time um, activity of motor areas of your brain when you imagine certain movements with high precision. So for example, you imagine closing and opening your fist um, and uh, such algorithms are very efficient in um, actually learning very fast which um, side you imagine to move, which was not possible to that degree uh, with previous linear algorithms. So we see a lot of improvement um, there. And the other big area or big expectations are related to the idea of closed loop interaction uh, by which, uh, um, for example, an EEG system or uh, an implanted electrode system in a paralyzed patient would be able to adaptively um, learn on the brain data of the patient and become better and better and better at decoding um, over time. For example, to use a spelling program or to operate an autonomous robot. So, so the, the patient would basically train and the system do some mm -hmm. movements or yeah. some thoughts or some yeah. speech and the system would pick up the brain activity yeah. and to see then 
before yeah. what he's kind of doing yes and with or imagining yeah previous paradigms and algorithms for eeg decoding there was always a certain kind of ceiling so after a couple of um, hours um, of training um, the algorithm just wouldn't get better but would uh, sort of stop at a certain level but um, in a real closed loop um, setting one would expect that the um, adapt activity um, of the um, artificial neural network would perhaps um, uh, be able to push uh, the decoding uh, further and further and eventually also be able to um, use different areas um, of the brain uh, for, for different tasks, for example, something that's just not feasible today. Today you only you can train um, the system for one area only, say from the motor area, and you leverage that for some particular task. But in the future, we expect to see systems to become much more flexible, individualized, and, um, uh, and adaptive. I mean, you, you went to all these labs uh, for your film and talked to people who are working on it. What is your perspective? What can be read out right now? I mean, ask different scientists, you will get different answers. And, but for me, this idea, um, I, once somebody told me, it's a little bit like looking through a milky glass, like with using EEG, because the, like the skull kind of is a strong protection, so you cannot read thoughts. That's impossible, and I personally think that won't be possible in the next so. fifth, fifth thoughts, 50 to 100 years. But with, what you can do is, you know, if somebody is most likely concentrated or not concentrated, is awake or not awake, and neuromarketing companies, for example, already start to use this to determine if somebody has an appetite for something, for example, likes something or doesn't like something because there are certain patterns in the brain that they say kind of show them if you show them a Starbucks cup, for example, if they like that kind of product or not, or even if they show certain prices, which price is too high and which price is too low, so they kind of use these, techn these techniques to determine the perfect price of a product. And if you go one step further, I also talk to a scientist in, in Canada who uses these technologies to determine if somebody, like the, the, the sexual preferences a person has. So he gets sexual offenders from court, and then he puts them in sort of immersive environment where he shows them avatar of for example, if it's like somebody who might be a pedophile of children, like not real images, really avatars, and he measures the brain waves, he measures the eyes, the eye tracking, and the physical arousal. And um, through this kind of three kind of um, body feedbacks, he then says with the high percentages he can say if somebody is most likely pedophile or not. And What's he's high percentage. I don't know. They, they, that's and, and I think there we go, go to, we kind of get the problem he couldn't tell me. And I think with all those kind of technologies, if you talk to other scientists, they will question like how kind of valid this is. Um, and we kind of very uh, easily enter a, a field where, you know, there are studies conducted, but then they cannot be replicated. And it's very hard to really say what is really true and what is not. But the, the problem I see here, it's used and it will be kind of continue to be used and it's very hard if somebody like if you have a EEG on your head and I tell you well I can read this out of your brain it's subconscious it's very hard to say no it's actually not true because I mean I kind of seem to have this very objective measurements in my hand and I think that is, is, is the real problem especially when we start having tech companies using this technology yeah, now, before I come to the legal issues, I wanted to ask you one more question. You told me before that you are especially concerned about this kind of big data machine learning uh, aspect of uh, getting data from a collective, not just a patient, just one patient at a time, but if many times, let's all of us are sitting here wearing an EEG, a machine could p pick up much more information and decoded uh, modes of brain states. Uh, quite easily. Uh, that's one issue you said is very important to understand. It's not just for the patient and one patient, but if everybody's kind of uh, say, well, it's cool to have it, and then they get these data, they can learn about stuff which we don't know. Is it true? Um, I would, uh, thank you for paraphrasing uh, my thoughts, I would qualify it by saying what, for me, the most pressing problem is not the underlying technology, 
big data and machine learning because uh, they can be used in very beneficial ways uh, to develop new uh, therapeutic strategies and it will have disruptive um, impact on medicine as a whole field in precision medicine, uh, in genomic um, analysis, in every field of research, development and application that is data driven uh, we will see these techniques uh, being used but the question is who controls um, the data, who owns the data, and who decides uh, what kinds of projects uh, are being pursued. And so the, the underlying problem, uh, or the main problem for me, is the question of data ownership, uh, data protection, data dissemination, and data control. Uh, because now, as with all our personally uh, identifiable information, we already submit it essentially for free for non-essential um, um, services like self-expression on the web or communication. We give the data to free to, to those companies and if they now um, develop gadgets um, that promise to leverage your brain activity to get a better user experience um, from your social media feed or from VR entertainment or in gaming, um, uh, people with a high affinity uh, uh, to new technology will easily adopt um, uh, these devices and this will potentially make um, brain data um, available on a very large scale if the companies decide uh, decides to um, have your uh, brain data uploaded into the cloud and then run machine learning algorithms to extract certain features to somehow improve um, their services so the actual point is that now is an historically opportune moment uh, to proactively think about these issues because those devices are not yet um, uh, available on a large scale uh, mm -hmm. uh, in contrast to the smartphones you all carry around and nobody's wearing an EEG cap as long as far as I can see yet uh, and so now is the time to really think about uh, how we yeah. want to treat that data. Okay, then let's turn to Silja uh, Wernicke and ask for the ethical and legal perspective on this. So, we are in an early state and we have regulatory frameworks about privacy and data protection. What is your view on that? Is that, do we have enough already? Do we have to think more about how to protect privacy in an age where we could be poss possibly reading out uh, thoughts or some states, brain states? So what do you think? What is the regulatory framework which needs to be applied to these kind of technologies? Uh, well, actually, I think brain data are special because uh, they potentially allow to have access to your personality. I think even if we are not so far today, if we think about five years or ten years, perhaps a thought reading will be possible, I don't know. Um, it's always hard to predict the future, but uh, we as lawyers and as ethicists, I think, have to think about how to regulate this. And um, there are different questions. We have the human, right, uh, human rights framework, mm -hmm. and this human rights framework protects your data because it has includes the right to privacy and the right to information. The problem is with the human rights framework that there is no human rights violation if you do consent. If you give your consent to the usage of data, there is no human rights violation. And this is really a problem because I'm not sure whether a consumer can really give a free informed consent if he doesn't understand the technique. So the uh, other question is whether we need further regulation and further ethical codes, um, especially as uh, companies are not bound by human rights. Human rights only oblige states. Human rights do not oblige companies. There's a certain kind of corporate governance, uh, governance uh, responsibility, but this is soft law. It's not hard law. And um, therefore, it's important, I think, to have uh, specific regulations. We have in Europe a kind of specific regulation with a, a Datenschutzgrundverordnung, but this Datenschutzgrundverordnung um, has not the special category of brain data. It has a category of um, health data, of uh, genetic data, of biometric data, but not brain data. Nevertheless, the rules could be okay, they could be sufficient. But when I looked at this um, regulation, I was a little bit astonished um, how broad the notion of consent is defined. Um, and if we have prohibitions, for instance, to use data to uh, select sex 
sexual orientations, then we had a lot, lot of exemptions. If you look at Article 9 of the regulation, you will have the prohibition and you ha have 10 exemptions where it's allowed to use this kind of data nevertheless. And this is a, was a little bit... Um, so these yeah. are exemptions from the rule of... Yeah, exemption from the rule not yeah. to use it. So even if uh, data mm -hmm. relied to sexual orientation, to political orientation, um, uh, kind of discrimination, there are exemptions. For instance, if you give uh, your data to the public, then uh, it can be used. And there are further exemptions. For instance, an exemption um, with regard to research. Um, at the first glance, it's a very good exemption because we need research, we need big data. But on the other hand, if you think about companies doing research... What is research? research? Yeah. You don't know, yeah. Mm. And um, uh, therefore, I think it's not sufficient. Yeah. But we have precedent, let's take DNA information, which is also you can consent, but can you give a general consent of that your, if you spit just something in a, and then let your DNA analyzed by a consumer genetics company? So how inclusive is this kind of consent concerning to brain data? Is it different from genetic information in your perspective? Um, at least... I mean the consenting. If, I, yes. if I say, well, I want to do this, I want to play, I want to play this game with my EEG head on and the company is sucking up data, I want to do this. So yeah. can I agree to stuff I don't understand what's going on in the back? Yeah, that's a problem of informed consent. Can you be really uh, be informed right. with regard to the um, consent you are giving? That's the first question. The second question is, uh, what are the limits for consent? Can there be limits or is our regulatory system based on the principle of autonomy? And if we look to the US, we would say, okay, autonomy is key. And autonomy means that you can decide what you want to do with your data. But the problem is we have a lot of nudging by companies, by states, etc. So autonomy is not the rational um, principle we, we think it is. Uh, in Germany, we have a different aspect. We don't stress autonomy only. We stress human dignity as well. And when you define human dignity as a kind of autonomy in a value system, mm -hmm. then you could argue that there are limits for free informed consent. You cannot uh, mm -hmm. agree to everything. And this mm -hmm. might be a path forward. Yeah. So we had this, this the conversation before, and when I kind of saw the exemption, I read like, okay, I mean, I just went through my Facebook feed and had to kind of consent to all those kind of things, and I had this very blue, big thing. I, I agree, I agree. And it's so easy to kind of give consent to everything and not understand, even if you know a little bit about the subject. And very often, you're really pushed into consenting to further use service. And I think that we really do have a problem if it, um, and we already have a problem, I believe, um, with the data we kind of uh, do give away. And we have seen what can happen with it. And we, we kind of see how it's not only used by, um, for advertisement, but also by insurances and by employers and, you know, um, kind of government and police. And I think if it goes this step further and if it's really brain data that is used, I'm personally scared, I have to say. Yeah, if you want to comment immediately. Yeah, uh, just picking up on your question on whether there is a difference, for example, between genetic data yeah. and brain data, I think it uh, points to another very profound aspect and, uh, uh, in that um, the ubiquity of um, collecting uh, personalized data through the process I would call sensorization so that our environment is um, uh, increasingly um, uh, using sensors in your smartphone, gyroscopes, um, geolocation, internet of things, everything um, is picking up data about your behavior, about your expressions, everything. This puts the notion of what actually constitutes biodata or biomedical data under enormous stress because there's no generally agreed uh, uh, definition about what constitutes biomedical data. We have historical notions and intuitions, something like that, like your lab data, uh, blood work data is biomedical data, that may be your Fitbit uh, pulse rate data is obviously biomedical data. But what about the fact that uh, uh, companies like Facebook in their research um, divisions 
can use your entries uh, in Facebook and your social media feed to make predictive analysis based on machine learning on future behavior like suicidality, uh, depressive episodes. You can use uh, geolocation data from smartphone, uh, smartphones um, to predict uh, if somebody with recurring depression is entering another depressive episode because they move around less, even before any physician, uh, any relative, or even the patient themselves would be able to pick, pick it up. So there's a whole gray area um, of new kinds of data that would traditionally not be considered to be yeah. biomedical data. Uh, and so one consequence of the whole discussion for me would be that the academic con community, but also the politics, uh, uh, need to needs to start a process uh, of actually defining classes of biomedical data and to take a very hard look whether there's something qualitatively different between say data from your Fitbit uh, tracker genetic data and maybe brain data so that would be a real um, impulse and consequence uh, to to, uh, to develop some such uh, framework in the future but it seems to me a little bit complicated to, to capture that if you have multiple mm -hmm. data or uh, uh, streams combined together by whatever technology you mean, and you can predict out of collecting these, which by the, on their own, maybe not biomedical information, but if you have the total, you, you get a biomedical uh, uh, inference of the, of the guy, basically. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sometimes the truth lies in, the com in combining different streams uh, and sources right. of data. But the, the real consequence would be something that actually submitting these kind of data is not such an innocent act as we uh, maybe uh, thought uh, the past 10 years, but that maybe um, everything you do on the web, um, every kind of behavior that is recorded and uh, is then used for predictive analysis should be especially protected. So one real idea or consequence uh, would be uh, that whether we perhaps need some kind of intermediate uh, body for data governance, a data bank, much like the bank that manages your money, maybe we need banks that manage um, our, um, our personal data and make them accessible under certain conditions uh, to researchers and also companies because now the route is from the individual directly to the company and whatever happens behind closed doors in the Google Health uh, Analytics Division or in the Facebook um, Health Cut Research off. Unit uh, is totally intransparent and we, and we only find out after the fact like with the Cambridge Analytica psychometric. Um, but on a concrete medical side, you, you even mentioned that case you have a, a locked-in patient, basically, who can only communicate through an interface which you can pick up. And then the, the doctor basically stores information about conversations he may have with his relatives to talk. And you said even there we have some kind of data protection problems because, of course, the physician would know some thoughts the locked-in patient shared with maybe his wife or whoever, uh, and, uh, but would not give to the doctor in any circumstance. And so, again, this idea that there needs to be an, uh, maybe an intermediate body protecting the data uh, with the interests for the patients, I mean, that's even a very simple thing. But, but this is happening in the clinic right now, or not? I mean, these kind of problems. You have that. Only research-based. Yes. Yeah, research-based, but you, you could have this di dilemma. Or what do you think? Um, actually, I, I, I think um, from a legal point of view, we have a different, um, uh, different differentiations between data. We have biometrical data which are protected. We have uh, genetic data which are protected. We have health data in this regulation that are specially protected. So um, as a lawyer, I wouldn't say we can't define it. We can define it if we know the purpose. The problem is rather to have this um, unclear data set and the big data uh, as a, a summary and then we have a kind of effect of health data which we didn't expect. But this is the pro problem of informed consent that we, not, we don't really know uh, how our data are used and this is, um, it's hard to solve. So tell us, how are these data used? I mean, you, you researched a little in these companies trying to make these kind of interfaces, so can you let us know a little bit what, what are they trying to do. Well, I mean, we are still in the research phase, and I think brain data is not really used in a big scale by any technical company right now, okay. and, and not yet. So we are still talking about the future, which is a great chance we're having right now, because we still can make an impact, and it's not 
as far in the future as maybe, you know, we, I think probably you've all read also about chips in the brain and brain, like human to human telepathy kind of communication, which is something that may or may not be possible one day in the future, but that's very far ahead. And what we are talking now, I would say it's five, ten years. Uh, in the future, we, we can still react. But what is the scenario? What but I mean, like, I think one scenario we've been talking about that kind of really struck me also is like if you kind of, if there's like a, a loop between you and the system, for example. So you wear this, this, this head, these headsets and you look at something and that kind of reads your brain waves and it reacts to it. And then kind of you react again to it and then you kind of create this loop and you almost become like, one, in a sense, like you kind of really connect with the machine, the, connect, the machine connects with you, and you might not even realize how, you know, you kind of, it's selling something to you, for example, and you kind of really want to buy this, this product all of a sudden, and I think this is a lot more intimate, like, sell than we, we are seeing right now, because it is really accessing something that you don't really want to share, it's, it's your brain, it's your subconsciousness. That's one that's, that's like advertisement. And I think the other risks are, as we, are, we have this uh, big data already, which is with what happens if insurances get this kind of data? What if they kind of have so much more information than they have already now? What happens if employers get this kind of information? I personally wouldn't want to sit in a, in a job interview and my brain data is monitored while I'm doing it, but I might not have the choice. Um. Concerning this situation, if I have some thoughts or brain states which I don't want to share, so in criminal law, for example, somebody wants to interrogate me about some behavior I possibly did, but I don't want to share with this. Mm -hmm. So how would that affect if it's possible to kind of read what I don't want to share out of my brain states sitting in front of an officer interrogating me? Uh, uh, this is a classical situation of a human rights context because uh, then you have a state action and the state wants to get data and the data are protect, uh, protected by human rights, by the right to privacy and right to information, informationelle Selbstbestimmung. And uh, in Germany it's only allowed to, to get very intimate data, for instance from a diary, when you have done, committed a, a criminal act, a murder, something like this. So it has to be proportional. Um, but if it's proportional, it's no violation of the human right. And uh, with the European regulations, the problem is that the exemption is uh, with regard to all criminal offenses and all preventive actions which are directed to uh, yeah, pro, um, to, to, um, not to allow any criminal offences, so it, it's not really regulating this question. It's still regulated by the nation state. Mm -hmm. So, as a doctor and having uh, seen these uh, developments, what would you say is the most important thing we have to really think about through now? from your perspective? Yeah, so from my perspective, uh, I'll just connect it to what I said. Um, um, earlier is to very critically uh, examine the way we give away uh, personally identifiable information, personal biodata, uh, whether from, uh, from uh, fitness trackers, uh, from our smartphones, from using um, um, internet services, um, and just resist uh, um, the temptation um, that is offered by these companies that, these, um, that gathering more data about us will make our lives um, any better than it could be uh, or, or is, because that promise also ties in with the um, sort of rising or prevailing discourse uh, um, about enhancement uh, and self-optimization, so it falls on fertile ground uh, in terms of, um, of feeding off of people's insecurities um, about how to, to become their optimal self. Um, so if you have a flimsy uh, uh, neurotechnology startup company that promises that if you use some kind of brain stimulation every day for five minutes you will become smarter, uh, or if you use an EEG feedback system to, uh, to wind down in the evening and become uh, more relaxed, people are going to eventually use it, even if the science is BS um, behind it, uh, because there's such a, uh, and this ties into sort of, that we should have a broader conversation in society about um, 
about this issue of self-optimization and, uh, and enhancement because it, uh, it will be a, a perfect business model uh, for a lot of companies out there. So in a minute you can start asking questions, but I wanted to, do you have specific recommendations after doing all this filming and doing the documentary what, for people, what not to do, maybe? I personally would love if you would go, could all wear those headsets and be protected. I don't think this has to, should be in the responsibility of the people not to use something, because they're great. Like, like possibilities also. I mean, I personally think I would. I think it would be cool if I could just, you know, flip on the computer now with my brain and tell it to play the video again, for example, something like that. Um, so I would like. I would like to be protected actually by 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 legal regulations so that I know this data is not used. And if you use. Uh, if I use, because I, f I think we've seen, I mean, we saw that with Facebook already. I mean, we all know what's happening, and I mean, how many people have left Facebook? One? <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> and um, I think that's, that's, that's the problem. Um, we, know that we know what's happening, we know it's kind of not really good, but we want to continue using the service, services because it's convenient. And I think the same is going to happen with, with, with those devices if they're on the market. Yeah? Before we open the floor, because we're really interested uh, in having um, everybody uh, on board for the discussion also, uh, I think it's also important to start a conversation with uh, people from, uh, from uh, technology on how to uh, uh, improve the security and privacy um, of devices um, uh, technologically on the hardware level and software level, so there are interesting ideas like federated learning, differential privacy, and if anyone is interested here in the, uh, in the audience, I'd be happy to discuss it also. Um, so to have not um, um, a conversation if we want to, in which we want to take away um, people's liberty uh, to do whatever they like uh, uh, in their lives, but to sort of have a more um, balanced uh, understanding and broader understanding uh, of the issues at stake. There were a few hands going up when we asked the question whether somebody has used a human brain interface. Is it true? You want to share what you did? Yeah, sure. We actually ran a workshop here Wednesday on um, it's more an art project. So we have commercial 300 euros uh, headset readers. Uh, that we connected to computers and with JavaScript and HTML, we programmed a simple art, um, yeah, some simple art that could be affected by how much we concentrated, how much we relaxed, and so on. And we, so we did that as an installation, as an interactive art uh, Wednesday here. Okay. You want to share? Uh, it was, uh, was the same. Okay, great. So here's a question. So just. Okay, I love this topic. <laughs> so it's been awesome to be at this conference. I'm traveling around, I have an ICO, I'm launching, but it's going slow. It's a neuroscience AI company. Um, the goal is to kind of like help people refocus a little bit more because we have trained our muscle of distraction way too much and we're paying people for when they're being focused obviously uploading their brain data. It's a big problem. We're slowing down our development because of the data issue, but I just wanted to bring this up this whole conference was about this apocalypse problem, right? Like sugar is not regulated as much, I believe, and it's destroying all of us. Many, many other things are not regulated that we're just consenting for it. And I think this is more important that people today use an EEG headset, look within, check themselves, see how distracted you are and refocus right now. Because that's a big problem when automation is coming and everybody is re-questioning their existence. This is a bigger threat right now is that everybody starts focusing, you know what I mean? Refocusing, learning how to concentrate instead of just like being scared of all of the problems in the world. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the statement. That was a statement? Yes. No you have a question? I have, I would. Yeah. Well, I have two thoughts on this. So first thing is, do you really need those headsets to learn how to concentrate? That's, that's, I know it can help you. The analytical mind, yes. Like if you meditate and you're spiritual, okay. But most of us, 85% of the world, don't have that ability to learn how to concentrate. Yeah. We can discuss it yeah. after the session. 
Yeah, I, I think we've got... Well, well, this is like, okay, we can discuss it after. The second is, I mean, yes, sugar is a problem, but big data is also a problem. And I don't think it's an ap apocalypse, far future uh, kind of problem. It's a societal problem that we already see the impact right now. And I think it is important to talk about it, and it's important to regulate it, to be able to use those devices for things that we believe is good. And we think sometimes big data is only a problem um, in states that are democracies. We have to think about China, for instance. Uh, there are big data projects going on as well. So I think it's really time to have something like a universal international, it doesn't have to be a regulation, but something like a declaration. We have a declaration on biomedicine and bioethics. Why don't we have a, reg uh, a declaration on data ethics as a universal interstate uh, driven declaration, for instance. Any more questions from the audience? Otherwise, I will continue with our, our debate here. So let us look a little bit into the future. I mean, just for the, from the medical perspective. So where is this going? I understand that if you want to read uh, non-invasively with an EG, you could even do it invasively, or you could develop new technologies which may be able, which we are not yet able to do, to get some information out of brain states. So what is on the horizon? Do you see some new technology coming up or some new ideas about how to, to get to know brain states, not just by putting in a needle or doing an EEG? Yeah, so, I mean, if people, if I can switch to sort of into neuroscience mode for a second, um, <laughs> Um, it's, um, those are actually two valid approaches that are already being pursued by large-scale um, uh, projects in Europe and the uh, US that have a different focus of how to better understand the brain. So the Human Brain Project um, uh, that uh, in the European uh, Union is using existing technologies like EEG, um, intracranial recordings, optogenetics, other technologies, and tries to scale them up in such a way to study many, many, many brains and to study one brain with many different um, av already available technologies to, uh, to arrive at a better understanding of the brain and then to be able to um, build a simulation eventually um, of a brain uh, and do computational modeling um, on this simulated brain. So that's one um, approach. Uh, the Brain Initiative in the US, which is also a multi-billion uh, dollar um, research endeavor, um, has the focus to develop new technologies to observe the brain and brain activity with the idea that existing technologies are just not enough because we have 30 years of uh, MRI-based neuroimaging, we have um, uh, uh, 80 years of EEG research, and we, ha we haven't made as much progress in understanding the brain as um, <laughs> to be, uh, yeah, uh, as people maybe expected uh, in the beginning. Uh, and this points to a very fundamental problem that you can, that affects any new kind of technology to observe the brain, that you have um, this problem of multi-scale observation so you can observe the brain at a very microscopic level, what's going on in one neuron or in an ensemble of neurons or in a small network of neurons. You can look at the whole brain activity using neuroimaging, but nobody has really figured out, has figured out a way to connect those different observation scales and different observation levels. And what goes on in one level may have no explanatory power whatsoever uh, if you want to explain thoughts or higher uh, uh, cognitive um, aspects of human existence, whereas um, observing the whole brain in action will maybe tell you nothing about how synapses work or small networks work. So this is a fundamental problem of neuroscience research that people the smartest people over the world try to figure out, and I don't see any really sort of big disruptive idea uh, in yeah. the next uh, years that will solve this fundamental problem. But if you look to animal experiments, and I saw in your documentary these uh, optogenetic uh, approaches, so we were talking a lot about listening to the brain state and getting out something, but we yeah. could also try putting in stuff uh, into the brain for some uh, uh, kind of... Uh, 
um, yeah, sometimes you have it already with uh, people who, who can move a robot arm, some, something, but with optogenetics, at least in the animals, you can try to uh, put in with light and genetically modified uh, animals and try to steer behavior. Maybe you can explain a little bit where this is going. It's not yet applicable to, germ uh, to humans, of course, because we don't want to create a GMO human, but the animals will uh, lead us to some certain behaviors we can just by light uh, impose on an animal. Well, I think you're referring to an experiment that was done by Steve Ramirez, who is at Harvard. And what he did was he could took mice and he kind of um, optogenetically um, altered their, their um, brain cells. And then when he kind of, um, kind of, he could turn them on and off. And that's how he could make the mice feel fear, which they hadn't done before. So he basically was able to implant fear in their brain. Um, which is quite scary because I don't want to have this happen. <laughs> I don't want to all of a sudden be like, oh, I'm so scared, I have no idea why. I mean, this is mice, and then I think there's a big, there is a difference between the brain of a mouse and the brain of a human. But what he told me, he said, like, he would say it's a little bit like a bicycle and a Lamborghini. Um, it, there's a big difference, obviously, between a bicycle and a Lamborghini, but they are both use wheels and they both kind of roll. So they are also similar, and we might be able to do this in the future. I also talked to another scientist who um, basically does implant chips to into now kind of people who are kind of have a, suffered from a stroke and who then able through these chips are able to kind of move artificial limbs. And the big advantage of chips in the brain is that they can read much better what's going on there because if it's outside, of course, you have to go through the skull. If it's inside, you can read it. And it's also a lot easier kind of to manipulate something. And I think this is the research that Elon Musk is doing right now with Neuralink and that also Brian Johnson, who we saw at the beginning of the film, was kind of going after. And this particular scientist, who is not a crazy guy, he's like a very kind of respected scientist in his field, says that he believes personally that in his lifetime, he will be implanting chips into healthy people's brains. And he's starting to write science fiction novels to prepare society for this. And we've actually asked, and I would be interested to hear this too, I would be interested who in this room would say, I want to have a chip in my brain if I get an advantage, and that's possible like maybe be healthier because it can give me some certain health information about it. So, and live longer. Who would agree? Yeah, so I would say Eight. that's... 10%? 10 percent. 10 mm -hmm. Early adopters? Early adopters. Mm -hmm. So we did, we, did have, we did make a study together with the Fraunhofer Institute and asked this particular question and we had um, every third person that we kind of asked, and it was around, around not, like close to 30,000, said they would implant a chip in their brain if they could live longer. I mean, if people want to hang around, we can do the implantation just afterwards. Um, <laughs> so I have... A I have a couple of chips here, so it's, yeah. really, it's no big deal, a little bit of bleeding, and yeah. Yeah. it'll be fine. Yeah. There's a question. Yeah. I just think it's okay, in relationship with what you were saying, uh, you guys talked about genetics, but what about epigenetics? And like, you know, epigenetics, uh, you know, the study of the environment. Like, I understand, this is the question I ask every neuroscientist. Everybody, especially Brian Johnson and Elon Musk, I think they're wrong. It's not because you go so close from the neurons that you're going to understand anything about the brain. The brain is also outside, it's also the environment. So what do you think about epigenetics and how wrong is it to go and try to implant something when we know there's a lot that we don't know about the environment? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I think, yeah, well, I think the question of epigenetics is obviously very interesting and, uh, and important. Uh, many different areas of clinical research now, especially psychiatry, um, how um, our environment... Um, um, so, for people who don't know, epigenetics is a new branch of research in the last couple of years that has shown that um, the switching on and off uh, of genes and the workings and expressions of our genes can be influenced uh, by environmental um, factors. So and that explains some of the variants of why identical twins, when they uh, grow up in different environments, uh, show different phenotypes. Um, and, that's, uh, um, and it has a lot of explanatory power for some hitherto uh, poorly understood uh, psychiatric conditions. And so it's an important topic, but I don't 
um, I don't see how that should be in conflict with anything neurotechnology um, does right now. So it's it, you could you could do the same that these companies do with epigenetics in mind. Um, it's not something I mean, that is it, fundamentally opposed. I mean, in, in um, any life, we will have epigenetic changes in yeah. our brain, of course. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, but there will still be in an environment and will and epigenetics works on all of us all the time, so it doesn't make a difference fu I, I, fundamentally. I, I, so. I think I think the the kind of problem that I see is broader. It's not only epigenetic. It's just like what Philip was saying. We don't under, fully understand the brain. We don't really know exactly what's happening. We don't know what consciousness is. We don't know where it is. Is it in the brain? Is it also in the body? So how can we know what happens if we change too much? We put like chips and we start to kind of really manipulate it, make us more intelligent, for example. I mean, we don't know kind of what other consequences that might have. Yeah. On the legal side, so... Yeah, on the legal side, I would like to make a remark on the enhancement problem, because I think from the classical human rights perspective, you can't really solve this problem. It's still part of autonomy and you could say as long as nobody is hurt it's fine yeah no human rights violation but the problem will be probably that only few people in a certain society can afford this kind of techniques this means the gap in the society will broaden which on the other hand means if we have some kind of social rights perhaps we can limit the negative effects even if we allow uh, allow some kind of enhancement on the basis of autonomy but yeah. Want to comment on that yeah, just uh, on the question, so the people, uh, um, because we talked a little bit about people using um, brain stimulation devices, because there's a very active scene of so-called biohackers, you know, most people will know this, that put chips uh, in their body, that try out uh, BCIs, build them themselves with 3D printers, use commercially available um, um, devices for brain stimulation. And there's an argument uh, in a debate about cognitive liberty that people, um, if they don't harm others and don't um, harm themselves in unacceptable ways, they should have the freedom to do to their bodies whatever they like, much in the way that we don't um, um, regulate body modifications like tattoos or... Um, or, or um, other body art, um, people, there is a strong, as it's very hard to argue against people's freedom uh, to modify their biological makeup in any way. And if you, just as an aside, if you um, consider the now uh, new powerful methods of genetic engineering like CRISPR-Cas9, um, people will eventually start, um, citizen scientists and biohackers will eventually start uh, to use CRISPR-Cas9 to modify their own genome. And that's, there will always also be a very important debate um, whether that should be somehow prohibited or whether there's a fundamental right to modify one's body if no other person is harmed. Yeah, I think it's, it's hard um, to prohibit or limit if, if, you, if your basis for your arguments is autonomy. But if you have other principles like fairness, justice, etc., then you can find some reasons why there should be limits for self-enhancement. I think this is very important to stress. I think it's not enough just to stress autonomy. This is not the solution for our problems. Right. But, but do, you, do you see, if you now look to what we were talking about from a, a legal perspective, I mean, is there, I mean, we had these kind of discussions with biotechnology, genomic uh, biology, but with the brain, as far as I can see, there is no legal initiative right now, is it, in the Ethics Council or some other uh, governmental bodies or ethics communities? Is it just not yet known what would be possible or what may be possible or is it just, I don't know actually. I'm, I'm a science journalist so I could not name a single ethics committee working on these kind of issues right now. I'm not sure about this as well at the moment, but we had a big debate at the German Ethics Council when we talked about organ transplantation. Uh, what does it mean to be dead, etc. And there are a lot of gray areas as well, but this is certainly a different question. 
Um, well, if I may say, I'm a member of the International Neuroethics Society, which is an association um, of professionals uh, from different academic fields that work in the emerging field of neuroethics. Um, and they have uh, things like an emerging issues task force that puts out statements and does active research on sort of horizon scanning and emerging um, issues in neurotechnology and neuroethics. So there are some activities, but they're not very well known and not, not very um, far reaching uh, yeah. yet. So there's no neuroethics, dedicated neuroethics research group uh, or institute in Germany yet. Um, mm -hmm. So this would maybe be something for the future. So basically the time is over, but I would like to ask the last question to you. So as a journalist looking into this and you have made this uh, movie, what kind of developments are you looking for? What, what will happen in the next few years? What is your prediction and where do you look? At which lab type of labs or research communities? Where to look? Well, it's always hard to predict the future, but um, I think it's very interesting, of course, what's happened, what Facebook is doing, um, and uh, like these big tech, com tech companies, those are kind of the ones having the money and driving kind of the technology, and we know that they're looking to new forms of technology, not also only EEG, but other ways how to read our brain waves. And the second, is what I already said is a DARPA, so that's, that's, that's military. Um, and there's, there's one kind of thought I would like to stress for at the end, because I mean, we've been very negative right now. We've been said, oh, it's so dangerous, you can read people's brain, you know, augmentation is a problem. And I think there's also great chances, I mean, I think to understand our brain better and to use it and to kind of use it for a benefit, it's awesome, it's really cool, and I think um, I would like to kind of see this happen in one way, but I think the big problem really is those dangers like big data and also maybe certain form of augmentation and causing social injustice that I feel we really need to have a debate about right now, and we really need to kind of, as, as people, kind of say, okay, we, we don't want to have this happen, for example, and to put pressure also on governments and regulations to get out of this gray area that we are now, and maybe we have institutions, maybe not, maybe there is an like, exception, in the, or maybe not, to really be very clear and say, we are protected here so we can, you know, use these technologies and be safe. So, we are finished now, and I would like to thank you for listening to this uh, just one hour, but he has a movie if somebody wants to stay here and just have a brief look at uh, a video you can introduce. This is more patient-related uh, uh, stuff. Well, it and would be a, a short demo of an EEG-based um, brain-computer interface for operating an autonomous robot, uh, which is the first one uh, that uses deep learning for EEG analysis to operate uh, an autonomous robot. So we're coming out of the neurotechnology uh, uh, group in Freiburg. So if you want to stick around, it's uh, about seven minutes and I can explain a little bit uh, about it, uh, if you want. Is it in English? No, the video is silent. I can... It's I can. just picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but yeah. for, for the rest of you, so thanks a lot for being with us and thanks to the uh, fantastic uh, speakers here on the panel. Thank you a lot. And if you have any questions, you can come here and we will yeah. be here. We are going to stay in this room. Is it possible to open windows? Yeah. <laughs> I'm close to that. No. No. no, we have just went to the end.
uh, and the robot um, the robot essentially has the, the robot essentially has the same uh, intelligence built into it. It has a full laser based representation of that space uh, and so he gives the commands uh, with the analysis of his brain data, and all the robot does is move around uh, and complete uh, the tasks. Uh, and it's uh, three times as fast as it actually happens because um, it takes a long time. The robot makes a lot of makes lots of a uh, lot of errors, and it stops sometimes. Um, but this is really sort of a demonstration of feasibility of what those systems could be able uh, to do if they become better and better. So here you can see the close-up view that the robot has now the task to pour the liquid uh, into the cup. Uh, actually, there's no liquid in the cup because the robot is so expensive that if there was a mistake and the liquid would pour over the robot, uh, that would be a big, uh, big mistake. Uh, are bad for the robot, um, but it would work uh, quite nicely, actually. So, um, and all the while he maintains uh, this high-level uh, task of pouring um, the liquid. Uh, and as you can see, the movements of the robots are still very, very uh, slow. So, this is so. This is actually the state of the art. The best you can do with EEG decoding, and so it would be very hard to see how one would be able to operate a killer robot because uh, it would be very easy to get away from it because it's so, uh, uh, it's so slow. Um, okay. So, and this is uh, what always happens uh, during such um, experiments, um, that there's, you know, sometimes confusion, sometimes the robot doesn't know what to do, Sometimes uh, the system has to be recalibrated, so it doesn't work at all uh, perfectly. Uh, and maybe I can, I can move forward a little bit, just to show you uh, the end result. So the robot is then able to, he takes back and now takes the cup to the subject. Um, and now the high-level goal that is selected by the subject is drink. Give me the drink. Now here you see the close-up. And the robot is approaching very slowly, tilting the cup. And this is the delicate part now, because if the liquid spills there, imagine if it was hot coffee or something, uh, this could be really an accident. And here the subject still moves to somehow meet um, the cup. Uh, but eventually it should work also in somebody who's so severely paralyzed that uh, she or he cannot move her head um, at all. Um, and also if you notice, I mean, when you're in the room with such a robot, they can be quite intimidating. So the whole area of sort of human-robot interaction, how the design uh, uh, and the way the robot is built, um, affects the feelings of the subject, whether they feel threatened um, or the whole issue of proxemics, like how close can the robot uh, get to my face before I become uh, 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 uneasy, uh, is really something that's uh, very underexplored in human-machine uh, interaction research, because nowadays most robotics labs, like the one in Freiburg also, has this industrial robot, and they say, hey, we've, we've got this industrial robot, let's see if we can operate with uh, it with brain activity, rather than taking a user-centered design approach and asking what would be the preferences um, um, of the patients uh, for such a system, uh, and then develop the, the robots bottom-up. So that would be the next phase in human-robot uh, design and interaction. So thanks for sticking around, and if you have questions, um, I'd be happy. Yeah, so uh, with the deep learning framework, uh, it uh, can be anything between three and six hours of training. Okay, so they didn't start at that point. No, they, they had to train um, before, but it's much faster than the previous iteration, previous algorithms. So, 
Yeah, well, that's a big question. I mean, systems like that or iterations of that, such systems have been around for quite a while now. Uh, and the bottleneck is actually a real clinical translation, getting away from doing this in research labs and moving into uh, people's homes, being able to bring the technology to the people. That's really very difficult because also, I mean, you have to imagine that these kinds of very severely paralyzed patients that, are, that would benefit most from such a system, uh, there are not many um, uh, patients around. Um, uh, and so not many companies are interested in, in sort of building a commercially available um, robot system right now. Yeah, well, that's a different approach, but people work on that too. So.